because this was in the closed beta. Yeah. All right, so real, what do you think? real quick, guys. Yeah, so let's, okay. Sorry, we're gonna. I'll get back. Just as, yeah. just as you were about to answer the question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> let's take a pause for a second. Hope also, uh, you know, let's just tune in here. Uh, we've got, uh, like I said, DJ DC here. I'm gonna pass the floor over to him. And again, this is our artist podium. We are just gonna be talking about, uh, you know, what it is to be a DJ and coming from a real experienced guy. Uh, just some words of wisdom for you guys for this student night at Off Center. All right, so big round of applause for DJ DC. Now. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me in the building. I am Off Center alumni. Um, at one point in my DJ career, I was probably, let's see, I said about four years ago, so I was probably about five years in as a pro DJ when I came to Eric because I needed refining on my scratching skills because I realized that um, you, mean, you have to round out your skill set in order to make yourself a better better commodity in the industry. So I came here and I humbled myself to his experience and I walked away from it and the knowledge that I took from him helped to propel me um, to the point where I managed, I was inducted into a band and we went on to become like, well we still are one of the top indie bands in the country, DLV, shameless self-promotion. But um, yeah, um, when they announced the whole artist forum thing, I definitely jumped on board. I was hoping that I could come by and at some point talk to people that have either taken courses or want to take courses or um, even like the, these, like the guys that are the other instructors here that have already been doing it and just like share my side of the story as far as like, you know what I've been through in the, the years that I've been doing it. I've been probably DJing for since I first started, like the first time I actually touched turntables, was probably about 1992. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the first time I put my hands on turntables and I was, I was a young buck, I was like way too young to like get into any kind of bar. I was like, like grade 11 or something, grade 10 or 11, and it was actually DJ Rock the House. I went to summer school with him. And we, we went to his place for lunch and he had two 12s and a mixer set up in his bedroom because his dad was a DJ and he inherited his dad's record collection. So he was like, he's like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna work out for a bit. I'm like, all right, gonna work out. I thought he's gonna like lift some weights or something. He puts some records on and he starts going back and forth. I'm like, that's a workout? I'm like, what is this? Show me how to do this. So he, he gave me some, he started giving me lessons like every time, um, every day. And then it just it just took off, and the, the the bug that he planted just led to me um, buying my own set of turntables, buying my own creative records, and just learning more and more and more and more. Um, and that basically spearheaded the career that has put me in the position that I'm in now. Um, I mean, as I was talking to Eric upstairs, uh, the most lucrative opportunity that just came across my my desk per se is that um, I was I made the short list to be Pitbull's next tour DJ. And it came down to me and the Jump Smokers. And the only reason why they got it is because they have a production studio. But what I was told from the record label was DJ to DJ, those guys can't talk to me. But production wise, because they have the whole remix shops, they have the production credit and they have that aspect of their careers behind them. That's what led them because and because I don't have that. And I do plan on coming back to Offset or learning the whole machine Ableton thing and being able to round out my skill set in that sense. So the next time an opportunity comes that way, I'm not just like the sickest tour DJ, the sickest bar DJ, the sickest club DJ. I'm also doing like my own remixes, producing my own beats and bringing that aspect and that side to the table. So um, I don't mind losing to them because I mean those guys are those guys are hot. Um, on a brighter note, I was compared to David Guetta, and I apparently make him look like a total hack. But that's because. <laughs> but we'll just leave that aspect alone. Anyhow, um, let's speed this along. Um, I had some things that I wanted to specifically say to you guys, and I had some notes lined out. I've been working on this for the last couple of days because I wanted to make sure that my thoughts were organized and concise, and that. Afterwards, I had something that I could send to you guys that you can look over and be like, okay, I know he went like 60 miles an hour during the speech, but let me read it back again and be like, oh, okay, that's what he was saying. That kind of makes sense. So, who in here is a student? We have three students? Okay. So, what I want you guys to do, uh, I want you guys to put up seven fingers. Seven fingers. I'm going to ask you seven questions. Okay. See, whatever you first 
move into a room or a house or an establishment, is the first thing you set up your music system? If that's if that answer is yes, then keep all seven fingers up. If it's no, then put a finger down. Okay. You can't just let music play when you're hearing it. You always you organize it in some fashion. It flows. It tells a story. It either BPMs up or BPMs down, or it's like it's all love or it's all something. But it never just you never just let it go random. So finger up, finger down. Okay. You find yourself saying, "Oh man, that sound sounds like," or "That song sounds like," and it's like you hear something like, and then all of a sudden you're googling and searching and trying to figure out. Okay, if I take these lyrics, I can Google and find out where that song came from. You find yourself doing that? Yes? No? Okay. Um, you prefer to listen to your music with an earshot of other people. You don't just like, you like banging in your headphones, but whenever possible, you, you want to hear it loud. Yes. You want to hear it out there. And you retreat to music when you're emotional. It's like your go-to. Music is your comfort food. Yes, absolutely. Um, you forget what someone's saying when a choose when a song that you like comes on. <laughs> like you're in the middle of a conversation and the tune comes, it's like squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, you're always the first to notice when something is played twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. All right, so you've got six fingers up. Seven. Seven? What? <laughs> <laughs> you're seven. You're, you're, you're seven. So you guys are in this for the right reasons. You guys are all beasts. You guys all have that passion, that drive, what it takes to take this as far as you want to take it. Like you can be a club DJ. You can be a toy DJ. You can be just a home DJ. You can be whatever you want to be from this because deep down rooted inside you is that passion that will never die when it comes to music and manipulating it in your own sense. Um, that being said, that was so fast. Oh my God, you guys are fucking awesome. So, the many faces of DJing. So, like I was telling Eric upstairs, there's the home DJ versus the bar versus the club versus the studio versus the band versus the tour. Home DJ, you DJ for fun, you're a music collector, you have artistic, you, you like an artistic playback. Um, you can... You don't plan on taking it to the bar, you don't plan on taking it to a concert, you don't plan on being part of a band, you don't plan on being in the studio, adding effects or elements or something, but you're just somebody that likes to stay home and play music. These type of people are the kinds that have like the phonograph, they have like the hundred year old records, they have the limited edition collection of something because their stuff never leaves the house. They're a lot different from a bar DJ and I've DJed a hundred bars across Ontario. It's crazy, but when you DJ in a bar, your stuff has to be a lot more durable. You need like to scale down your set so that you can fit into a small space because they're all about whatever their floor space. Every table in a bar represents a thousand dollars. So if they have to give up tables for you, they're giving up potential income. So that's the dif basically the difference between a home DJ and a bar DJ. A club DJ is a whole different story. You don't have to worry about walking with as much equipment. Um, you're probably just walking with your laptop or walking with um, a USB key. What I usually do is I have um, dual uh, cloned USB keys that I want. If I'm going to DJ a bar, I have one key in each pocket and they're cloned. They all have sorted folders of music. So if my laptop fails, if the DJ that's on there, his laptop fails, if he's a tool, if they got a pair of CDJs that take, that take USBs, bop, bop, and I'm ready to go. Um, then studio. Studio is a whole different story. Studio is kind of like, kind of like where, what, what Eric does when he takes a record and he uses the record as an instrument and he starts implementing elements into something. And this is where learning how to scratch, learning how to sample, having a really good sample bag comes into hand. I've worked with bands before where I've gone in and I've taken like Chinese kung fu effect and basically just scratch it with, "What are you here for? I'm here to kill you, kill you, kill you, kill you." And that's it. And you're in and out in like an hour, but all of a sudden it shows up on somebody's record and that turns into royalties. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I'm a part of this band's hit or I'm a part of this band's contribution to the universe. It's crazy. Band, um, like I said before, I'm part of DLV. I'm the rapper slash scratcher slash um, element effect adder to, to that. So basically what I do in my band is I, my band is an electro pop rock band um, with heavy guitar influence. We have two lead singers. One sounds like Annie Lennox, the other one sounds like Sinead O'Connor. 
Um, they both can destroy a place without a microphone. They're like the two of the best vocalists you hear in Canada. But it's really rare because their music is kind of like Linkin Park meets LMFAO. And then I come in and I'm like, and then I grab the microphone and I start dropping a hot 16. So it's just like a crazy dynamic. But in order, the thing that got me to that dance, I mean, the lyrics got me in the same room as the band, but what got me part of the band is when I realized that, okay, I need to refine my scratching skills. And that's when I came back here and saw my man and he was like, okay, you don't suck and you're not new. But let me unteach you some things and let me teach you what you need. So you always need to keep your head open as to when you need to add to your, add to your skill set, refine your skill set, or come back and refresh your skill set. And you have to humble yourself because you have to understand that you may think that you're at better than something or better than most, but at some point you're going to be tested and you're going to be weighed and you're going to be found wanting. I don't know. I, you, <laughs> a nice tale? Yeah, man. Favorite fucking name, <laughs> sir. And then there comes to being a tour DJ, what I call the the cap of the monte, the top of the mountain. When you're a tour DJ, and I've toured, I've toured as myself, and I've toured with an artist. And when you tour, you've got equipment managers, you've got a setup budget, you've got roadies, you've got a stage manager. You basically walk in there like you're going to a fashion show and you step up and everything's already set up for you, plugged in, tuned, sound effect, sound um, sound um, tested, and it's just, okay, showtime, boom, and you kill it. And it's crazy, but it's like, it's kind of where you wanna, it's kind of where you wanna go. You just, like I said, you show up and you show out. But that comes after establishing yourself and becoming a commodity that somebody wants to add to something because a DJ is an add value, you're an add-on. You're you're a performer, you're an artist, but you're an add value. And if you don't establish the value, if you don't come to the table saying, okay, this is what I'm worth and believing that, and people call me like the most arrogant son of a bitch that you'll ever meet, but I'm not. I'm just confident in my ability because I recognize my own weakness and I refine my weaknesses into strengths. So what does it take to make it? Is anybody familiar with the, the Gladwell 10,000 hour theory? That um, if you spend 10,000 hours doing one thing, you are a master. Well, Gladwell was usurped by this guy named Philip Goss who created the 1,000 hour theory. And what Philip said was, if you spend 10 hours doing something, you're familiar at it. You spend 100 hours doing something, you're proficient. You spend 1,000 hours doing something, you're pretty good. 10,000 hours makes you an, makes you an expert. Um, I did a slight calculation and Gauging by when I first hit the turntables until now, I've probably put 12,480 hours into DJing. <laughs> so I'm slightly above expert and slightly below retarded. <laughs> but um, it's, it's one of those things where you got to invest in it. Like I tell people all the time that I, I practice 24-7. And they're like, well, you're not in front of turntables 24-7. I'll DJ an entire party in my head. Like remixes and all, genre changes and all, and just go on track to track to track to track to track to track to track in my head for like four hours at a time. You just, you just always got to find whatever spare time that you have to do something related to what you love. And that'll make you better at it. So investing the hours doesn't necessarily mean, okay, if I'm not in front of my turntables, then I'm not practicing. No, if you're thinking about music, if you're arranging your music, if you're just sorting, categorizing your music, if you're making, backing up your music, if you're manipulating music in some way, you're investing time in it, you're practicing because you're making a conscious effort to devote to what it is that you have a passion for. So don't sell yourself short by thinking that if I'm not here at Off Center, I'm not practicing. Or if I'm not on my laptop banging tunes, I'm not practicing. Or if I'm not at a friend's house or at a bar broadcasting out to the universe, I'm not practicing. As long as you're doing something committed to the manipulation of music and, the, and, com and committing to that passion, you're practicing. But you always have to practice. Oh, let's see. Where are we? Uh, what does it take to make it? We already discussed that. <laughs> so there's, um, like I said, there's the, the thousand hour theory. There's 
the whole harmonizing your social media. If you want to be a DJ that's working in the industry, you need to harmonize your social media when it comes to your professionalism. My website is djdctoronto.com. Does anybody want to guess what my Instagram is? djdctoronto. Anybody want to guess what my Twitter is? DJDC Toronto. We're seeing a trend develop here. If you Google DJDC Toronto, guess what you're gonna get? <laughs> you gotta harmonize that. You gotta be easy to find. You gotta you gotta search engine optimize yourself first before anybody else to do it for you. Um, niche. When it comes to DJing in the industry, you need to either Pick a niche market that you want to get into and invest completely or start learning, excuse my language, in music. <laughs> it's either you focus on one thing or you renaissance yourself and engorge yourself on everything. I mean, I, I plugged my iPod into a bar the other day and it went from Fall Out Boy to Joss Stone to Mozart to Edith Piaf to Fetty Wap to like most deaf and then back to something like Celine Dion and and people in the bar were like have you sought mental health <laughs> because that's kind of schizophrenic I'm like I'm trust I'm a lot more organized when I DJ I promise but you just have to engorge yourself in different kind of sounds so that you're able to manipulate everything and you have like a fundamental rudimentary knowledge of a little bit of everything um another one obscurity versus notoriety Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but it's the road to obscurity. If you pattern yourself after somebody else in the industry, then you will be like the flash on a camera. Like if people are looking at you, they'll see it, but if they're not, you're gone. You're here and you're gone that fast. And I'm coming back to Offset, and like I said, I'm gonna learn the programming aspect of the game because I got that flash. I got put up in front of like the number one artist in the world right now and the shutter clicked the flash went off and they're like okay um yeah who's that guy well oh he's gone because he doesn't have the production chops behind him so you've got to understand that like i said imitation is the best form of flattery but you have to establish yourself you have to do something different i need to put out my own original content in order to establish myself as an artist and that way i'll be taken seriously as a dj because anybody can play music. Anybody can just plug in an iPod and play music, plug in their phone and play music. But when you're playing your own music and you're putting your own fingerprint on music and you're putting it out there, eventually when you start leaving your fingerprints everywhere, people start noticing your fingerprints and start tracing them back to the source because they want to find out where it came from. When people start looking for you, that's when your stock goes up and you become that asset that I discussed earlier. Um, another thing, take care of yourself mentally, physically, chemically. <laughs> um, don't want to be an ass, but you got to stay in some sort of shape because you could be dealing with a 15 minute set. You could be dealing with a 45 minute set. I DJ the first MMA expo in Canada. I was the DJ. I was the guy. I was there with Shoney Carter, um, with Dan Henderson, with Gary Goodrich. And we did three days at the International Center. I DJ 12 hours a day. The second half of the second day, I did the sound engineering for the Affliction Band pay-per-view, which means I got the sound engineer for Moro Ronello. Does anybody know who Moro Ronello is? Moro Ronello is the commentator for WWE SmackDown. And he is like one of the one of the signature commentators in like all of MMA. He's done Pride, he's done Glory, he's done UFC. Like if you Google more Ronello, he is like MMA legend. And I got to like sound engineer for him. I actually like got down on one knee and handed him the microphone. Like, Aah. but I mean that's what like the that's what I'm talking about. You need to be ready for anything at any time, and you need to take care of yourself mentally, physically, chemically. Um, I say stay in some sort of shape, be able to be able to last, have some kind of endurance. You're going to be carrying heavy shit on a regular basis, your regular basis. You need to be able to know that you're not going to injure yourself after two weeks of moving around from bar to bar, place to place and whatever. I mean, Eric will tell you stories. He's probably, probably has, has a very good relationship with his chiropractor. Not to mention where you sleep, right? Like, oh, yeah. You're not, you're not in your bed for, for a long time. No, so. exactly. Yeah. And um, chemically. <laughs> Just because it's free doesn't mean you should put it in your mouth. 
I'll just leave that one there. Basically, most important rule of all, this is the ultimate way to get paid to do what you love and to have fun doing it. And do not forget the fun part. Done. I drop. Nice. Thanks so much, man. That was super, not only entertaining and informative, but just all around. Oh, you just missed it. But, uh, <laughs> definitely good to have you guys. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Anthony, for DJ DC? Uh, anything that popped in your head that, that may or may not be? Sure. <laughs> I swear I had planned to answer this before I even started. Um, long story short, what happened was, when I got back into the DJ game professionally, um, when I, I just graduated from DeVry with my degree and I said, hey, I'm going to be a DJ again <laughs> with my computer degree. <laughs> Don't tell my mom. But um, so I, I had a DJ name. My original DJ name was DJ B. And it basically was like D, A, J, and then B because my initials are AJB, Anthony Jr. Bailey. It was like the most unoriginal shit ever. So I went out to all my friends and I was like, I need a DJ name somebody come up with it because I hate when people pick their own nickname so I was like I don't want to pick my own name. I don't want to be that guy so one of my friends was like dude you've got like a dozen god kids so why don't you be DJ Don Corleone the godfather because you're so gangster and you've got god kids I'm like okay so I went and I googled DJ Don, Cor DJ Don Corleone there's like 1900 DJ Don Corleone and one of them is a producer for Sean Paul <laughs> I'm like, so somebody's already taken this name to that level. I'm not going to be DJ Don Corleone Jr. I'm not going to be DJ Don Corleone II. So I'm like, okay, fuck the Don, fuck the Corleone, DJ DC. And it looks really good on... <laughs> this. One of the benefits of being a DJ is having your name on everything, just in case you forget. It's like sewing your name into your socks at summer camp. But, um, yeah, anyway. How do, how do you set yourself apart from other DJs who, because um, all DJs seem to have access to the same tracks through they iTunes, don't. The iTunes and, and the internet? They don't. Oh, okay. Um, how, I, how I set myself apart is, I'm, my, my, I guess my niche should be I'm the remix master. Um, and so as much as I have access to the same songs as you do and you have access to the same songs that I do, if I can't find a remix, I'll make it. And I go out searching for remixes. So people are like, oh, so you're the remix master, so that you, you remix everything. So no, I don't remix everything because there's people out there with better resources than I have. But what I'll do is I will get every remix I can find of a song and I will listen to every single one of them. And I don't care if it's popular or not. But at some point, you, it clicks in that that one stands out just a little bit more than the rest. Because a lot of DJs, they'll get like five remixes to a song and they'll hear the first one and somebody else will play it and be like, okay, this is the popular one. Meanwhile... The fifth one is a banger. It's just nobody's gotten to it yet. I collect all five, and I listen to all five. And I might play the same one as you'll hear from starting from scratch, but I'll play that one that scratch and be like, dude, where'd you get that from? I'm like, oh, that was number five, dude. You stopped at one. <laughs> I stopped at nothing. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, we, we got another one uh, that we were actually kind of like, cooking up upstairs is uh, where where do you feel the um, the performance element of DJing um, and producing or anything anything along those lines where does that come into play and, and what makes an act like an act like what makes it the DJ the DJ what makes the performer performer you have to look like you're into it in terms of um, physically Performing you have to if, if you're just sitting there and you're just like firing tunes in and you're not actually Invoking the music and like feeling and writing the BPMs with your body which kind of helps you with your cadence for all those that have timing issues um, Moving your body to the music kind of helps you to oh, okay This is what's going on right here and then you use that to transfer the energy from one turntable to the next you have to put on a show and like I, like I was telling him in terms of the remixes, you can't just play music the way everybody hears it. Because if they hear it the way that they hear it, then you're, you're white noise. But if you put your own fingerprint on that song, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I came out to this party and I heard DJ DC do this. And then I went to this other party and this guy played the same song, but it didn't sound like when DJ DC did it. 
So the next time I see DJ DC's name somewhere, I'm going to go back and see DJ DC because I want to hear him do that again because I haven't heard it yet. This is why these guys go to festivals like Veld and they'll put down a mix at Veld that you won't hear anybody else and everybody else is playing catch up to hear what Tiesto did at Veld. And this is how those guys make their name. That's how the performance aspect comes into when you perform a piece and you contour it in a way that nobody's heard it before and you put your own signature on it. Then you make it unique and you create a unique experience. And that's what DJs are selling now. They're selling the experience. You get to be there when I did that. Go tell your friends because now they're going to watch it on YouTube and they can't feel the energy that was in the room. So yeah. I hope that answers the question. I think, I think so. so. Okay. So he's good. Good. He's good. <laughs> All right. Nice. Thanks again, man. No problem. Yeah. All right. I know he's got a he's got a show. He's got a bounce to yeah. now. So I'll, I'll be around for like another five yeah. ten minutes, and I'm going to live to run out in the nice before time. I get killed by Carl Cassell. <laughs> oh. Nice. Yeah. All right. Somebody play something. <laughs> All right. DJ's cool and it's silent. <laughs> <laughs> platoon on. Platoon on. Who's got the transition? Cool. Uh, hello, James. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Eugene, man. <laughs> so, how are you? How you doing? Good to see you, man. I see you. You got kids and everything, man. Yeah, man. Seriously, man. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs>